Ray Kurzweil is Director of Engineering at Google and the co-founder and chancellor of the Singularity University. Ray Kurzweil is one of the world's leading inventors, thinkers, and futurists with a 30-year track record of accurate predictions. Called the Restless Genius by the Wall Street Journal and the Ultimate Thinking Machine by Forbes magazine, Ray was selected as one of the top entrepreneurs by Inc. magazine, which described him as the rightful heir to Thomas Edison. PBS selected him as one of the 16 revolutionaries who made America. Ray was the principal inventor of the first CCD flatbed scanner the first Omnifont optical character recognition program, the first print-to-speech reading machine for the blind, the first text-to-speech synthes synthesizer, the first music synthesizer capable of recreating the grand piano and other orchestral instruments, and the first commercially marketed large vocabulary speech recognition. Among his many honors, Ray received the 2015 Technical Grammy Award, for outstanding achievements in the field of music technology. He's the recipient of the National Medal of Technology, was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame, holds 21 honorary doctorates, and honors from three U.S. presidents. Ray has written five national best-selling books, including New York Times bestsellers, The Singularity is Near in 2005, and How to Create a Mind in 2012. He's co-founder and chancellor of the Singularity University and a director of engineering at Google, heading up a team developing machine intelligence and natural language understanding. Here he is, Ray Kurzweil. Ray. Oh, Ray. Oh, Ray. Oh, Ray. Oh, here he is. Hello, Ray. How are you? Great. Good to see you, Bob. Always a pleasure to see you. Can you update us a little bit uh, on where we are on the law of accelerating returns? We always look forward to some uh, your annual update on where we are in the <coughs> charts and uh, how, how right you've been. Well, I'm actually writing a book, uh, The Singularity is Nearer. It's been 10 <laughs> years. Uh, the Singularity is Near, which came out in 2005, is holding up very well. But, of course, a lot has happened and some of the most impressive examples of AI have occurred since that time. In fact, many of them have been quite recent, like the Go Championship, or self-driving cars, uh, image recognition in, uh, the, that's better than humans. Uh, it was only five or six years ago that people were dismissing AI, saying, well, uh, AI can't even tell the difference between a dog and a cat, which was true. Now it, it can do that. and and. Uh, distinguish between thousands of other categories as well and do a better job at that than humans. Uh, there's uh, been tremendous uh, confidence in AI recently, so much so that people are now concerned with the downsides. Uh, we've gone from AI will never work to, oh my God, AI is going to work. And what does that mean for humanity? And we'll probably talk a bit about that. Uh, there are a few developments that account for that. One is a, a mathematical breakthrough. Uh, we can take the output of a, of a deep, of a neural net and feed it into another neural net and there, therefore create a two-level neural net. And we can keep doing that. And at, with each layer, the issues get more abstract. So at the first couple layers, you can tell straight lines and curved lines and uh, it may be the 40th level, you can tell that something's funny. It's about the 15th level that you can tell the difference between a dog and a cat. We actually couldn't go much beyond three, four, five levels as of maybe five, six years ago. Uh, and the reason was a mathematical one. The information kind of disintegrated as we went from one level to the next. And mathematicians such as Jeff Hinton, who's a colleague of mine at Google, were able to figure out a way to keep the information intact so it uh, would not disintegrate. It has to do with keeping convex services in multidimensional spaces. Uh, we also need a lot of data, and because companies like Google and Apple and Microsoft and others have lots of data on some things, uh, there's still a challenge to actually learn from a small amount of data. Humans can actually learn from just a few examples, at least some humans can. So that remains a major 
challenge to AI, something I'm working on and many other groups are working on to try to learn from just a small number of examples. Uh, we also need a lot of computation, and you mentioned the law of accelerating returns. We just updated our computational charts. Remarkably, it remains a perfect exponential going back to the 1890 census. We just updated it to 2014. The previous chart we had was 2010. Uh, I had this chart for the first time in 1981 through 1980. I projected it through 2050. So it's now 35 years later and we're exactly where it should be. It's amazing how predictable that is. Uh, but not only predictable, but exponential. And exponentials are quite transformative. They're seductive because at first it seems like nothing is happening. As I've mentioned before, halfway through the Genome Project, uh, only 1% of the genome had been collected and mainstream critics dismissed it as a failure. But 1% was only seven doublings from 100%. Indeed, it kept doubling every year and was finished seven years later. So exponentials started very slowly. They can actually sub be sublinear. Finally, they become explosive. We're now at a point in the press performance of computation and communication and other technologies uh, that it's really becoming transformative. It was just mentioned that we're about to connect all humans on the planet. The first time we've done that, that's because we've gotten to that point in the exponential growth of communication. And these developments have a profound impact on society. And as I go around, I'll just make one other comment, and I look forward to a dialogue. Uh, as I go around the world, people are pessimistic. You know, we see evidence of that in the election debates, for example. People think things are getting worse, despite all evidence to the contrary. What's actually happening is our information about what's wrong with the world, like, for example, about violence or poverty or environmental degradation, is getting exponentially better. A century ago, there could be a battle in the next village and you'd never even hear about it. Now we're immersed in events that happen halfway around the world. So I point out to people this is the most peaceful time in human history, and people say, what are you, crazy? Don't you pay attention to the news? Uh, well, your chance of being killed is dramatically less than it was centuries ago when there was dire scarcity of resources. There was no democracies. I mean, we, you could count the number of democracies on the fingers of one hand a century ago. You could count them on the fingers of one finger two centuries ago. Uh, I believe that the rise of democratization has to do with the rise of communication technologies, and so the world is getting dramatically better. Life expectancy was 37 in 1800, 48 in 1900. That's going to go into high gear now that we have this grand transformation of health and medicine into information technology. So things are getting better, but our knowledge of what's wrong is also getting better. And so I look forward to exploring that with you. Well, we were talking earlier about how AI has really exploded in the last year in the public consciousness, partly because of the technological um, uh, evolution that you have been so aptly uh, described over the last several decades. Uh, and we talked, we've talked a lot at this conference about the Go uh, Championship, which seems to have been somewhat of a watershed moment, not only for uh, AI, but also for the public consciousness. It really exploded in the public consciousness. Do you think that this, uh, the, this Go uh, ch championship was in, in any way significant. Uh, there was a comment I mentioned by one of the, the, the players there that the machine had made a move that it didn't, the player did not understand, but later described it as beautiful. Um, I don't know how to describe that, but the machine did something the human players did not think was going to happen and later realized it was a beautiful move. Something happened there, and I wonder if you think there was anything I important that's happened around this. Well, it's interesting. Uh, uh, <clears throat> in the early 80s, I predicted a computer would take the World Chess Championship by 98. It happened in 97. <clears throat> that was really a victory for the symbolic school of AI. That, uh, as many of you realize, it's been these two competing schools of artificial intelligence, being able to think things through logically, the so-called symbolic school, and the connectionist school uh, exemplified by neural nets, where computers basically emulate human uh, abilities at, at recognizing patterns. In my recent book, How to Create a Mind, I talk about how I believe the 
neocortex works. We have a lot of evidence for that now. And it's, it is a connection system. It's somewhat different, actually, than deep neural nets. It's a hierarchy of, uh, of modules that can recognize a pattern. I estimate we have about 300 million of those modules. And we create the hierarchy of pattern recognizers with, with our own thinking. Uh, we were, Deep Blue basically worked by figuring out the move, counter move sequences and great, it created a great tree of these sequences. And it used a little bit of pattern recognition to basically prune the tree because it couldn't really follow every uh, branch of the tree indefinitely. So if it's following a certain line of play and one side's down by a rook and a queen, it'll figure, okay, that's hopeless and prune that branch of the tree. But we can't actually do that in Go because the tree of move, counter move sequences expands too radically. There can be over 100 moves or 200 moves at each point. Uh, so you really have to apply deep levels of pattern recognition to look at the, at the board and say, and just feel, okay, this area is being surrounded and uh, be good to finish off this wall. And it, it's not really a logical analysis. It's more uh, essentially assessing the deep patterns uh, that, that, the, uh, uh, that is made by the, by the uh, board position. And that's something that humans have been better at with these breakthroughs recently and being able to create deep neural nets. Uh, we're now, computers are able to make these pattern recognition judgments. Uh, the Google Go playing program actually perfected itself by playing itself to generate the training data, and then it could assess the moves based on the outcome of these simulated games. Uh, but it was really a breakthrough of the connection to school, and that's really what has been soaring recently and accounts for the recent uh, surge in confidence and the ability of artificial intelligence. Yeah. I wonder uh, if you could sort of address what, what I call the new wave of uh, techno-pessimists that are out there. Uh, you addressed them 15 years ago when we had the Where's My Jetpack crowd who came out and basically argued that things haven't changed that much, the telephone isn't that much different. We're, we're getting a somewhat similar but more sophisticated argument. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Robert Gordon's book, The Rise and Fall of American Growth. Uh, uh, Gordon is a very respected professor at Northwestern University on the history of, of technology, and his book's rather long, but he, he talks about the great innovations in the Industrial Revolution, uh, about electricity and central heating, uh, and the internal combustion engine, indoor plumbing, and vaccinations, uh, and argues that since 1970, uh, there has been, the innovations since 1970 have been less transformative than the Industrial Revolution, uh, and they don't have the same potential to create growth in the future as we do in the past. Can you address that? It seems remarkable that somebody would make a prediction like that, particularly given one, we don't know what the future will look like, but number two, we have an inkling with things like robotics, genomics, machine intelligence, artificial learning. Can you address this sort of new wave of techno-pessimism that's out there? Well, it's remarkable how people can make arguments in the face of all reason. Uh, I mean, since 1970, we've seen the rise of the Internet, for example. It's certainly been profoundly transformative in terms of human communications. We've seen the rise of computers and AI and robotics, uh, and we're seeing machines do things that previously were the province of humans, like uh, driving a car, for example. Uh, it's absurd to say that these are not transformative changes, uh, tying together all the humans in, in the communications web, which was just alluded to before I came on, is, is a profound transformation in, in human society. Uh, but you can always argue that nothing has happened. Uh, certainly, as long as machines, there's anything, for example, that AI can't do, people will point that out as uh, a profound limitation that will never be surpassed. Uh, I have a cartoon with a furtive human race writing out signs and uh, posting them on the wall of things that computers will never be able to do, but you then see a whole pile of them pile on the floor, 
uh, that are not, no longer true, like uh, computers will never be able to drive a car, computers will never be able to tell the difference between a dog and a cat, computers will never play a master game of Go, and so on. Uh, we're now seeing computers creating art and music, and uh, ultimately there's no limit, in my view, to what machines will be able to do, but I would point out that this is not an alien invasion of intelligent machines from Mars to compete with us and displace us. Uh, we have always used our machines to extend our own reach, our physical reach, uh, created machines that leverage our muscles. You know, certainly unaided human muscles couldn't create skyscrapers. Uh, we now can access all of human knowledge with a few keystrokes. How many people could do their work without the brain extenders we already have? And these will become more and more profound and more and more intimately connected to us. So we're becoming smarter. Uh, you know, people are concerned, well, look at all these jobs and these machines are coming along and if they can't do these jobs now, they'll be able to do them soon. Well, we've already done that. I mean, how many jobs circa 1900 exist today? And the political difficulty is, you know, if I were oppression futurist in 1900, I'd, I'd say, okay, two-thirds of you work on farms and factories, and that's going to be 4% by the year 2015. And people go, oh, my God, it'll be out of work. And, uh, and I'd say, well, don't worry. We'll, we're going to create new jobs that will replace these old jobs. And people then say, okay, what new jobs? And my response would be, I don't know. We haven't invented them yet. That's kind of a weak political response, but it actually happens to be true. 65% of the jobs today in America are information jobs that didn't exist 25 years ago, let alone 100 years ago. And we keep increasing the sophistication of jobs, uh, and we enhance our intelligence. One method has been through education, uh, but we're also enhancing it by merging with intelligent machines, which you do already. You know, even though this isn't in my body and brain yet, uh, it's definitely an extension of who I am. Uh, and ultimately, we will put these directly in our brain. We'll connect our brains to the neocortex and extend the very nature of our intelligence. And that's so we're basically going to merge with these machines. That's why we created them in the first place, to extend our physical and mental reach. So why is, why is there such a prevailing sense of pessimism then? I, I hate to keep coming back to this, but when I look at Genome, I'm excited like you are. I, I read your work very carefully. I'm excited about genomics because I see the potential to cure long-standing diseases, particularly older uh, diseases of uh, old age, uh, like cancer and diabetes. Uh, I look at robotics. I see the potential for robots to help people, uh, particularly with dangerous or boring, repetitive jobs. Uh, I look like artificial intelligence. I see the and quantum computing. I see the potential to solve tremendously difficult problems uh, that we can't solve right now. I see tremendous reasons to be optimistic about the future of mankind, and yet every time we, the public seems to have a discussion about uh, new technology, we somehow end up with Skynet discussions. How do we try to turn this and make people aware of the positive nature of what's been happening without sounding like we're a bunch of Pollyannas? There were questions about this earlier from people saying, are you aware of all the negative implications of all this? How do you, how do you keep that, that drumbeat or that position that the world is getting better, that it's worth getting up every morning? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, I mentioned one reason earlier, which is our information about problems and what's wrong with the world is getting exponentially better. So, you know, every time we plug into the news, which is just about uh, every hour, uh, we hear about some disaster, some violent incident or some example of intolerance. Uh, and that's because our information about what's wrong is getting better. And that's actually a good thing because it motivates us to do something about it. But we can't always fix these problems immediately, so that leads to a certain frustration. Uh, we very quickly get used to the improvements. Uh, you know, life expectancy, as I mentioned, was half of what it is today, less than half, just 200 years ago. But, you know, when things uh, occur, it becomes... Uh, part of our everyday reality, and people can't remember when it ever wasn't the case. And these technologies creep up on us, 
So some years ago, Siri was introduced, and people said, wow, isn't it amazing? You can actually talk to your computer, and it'll understand you. And people say, yeah, it's not important because it does, doesn't really work very well. Then it gets better and better, and finally these systems work really well. And they say, wow, isn't it amazing? You can talk to your computer, and it understands you. And people say, oh, but that's been around for years. So <laughs> we, we get used to these things. I mean, just think back a decade ago, there were no social networks, no wikis, no blogs. You know, 15 years ago, search engines were just getting started. Uh, think of a world without search engines and without the internet. It sounds like ancient history. It was not so long ago. So we very quickly get used to the positive things. Uh, look at the future and change is always threatening because we don't immediately have an answer. Uh, I mentioned the political problem and it's really a, a underlies, I think, your question, or a response to your question. Uh, we see jobs going away, and we can't immediately describe what those jobs, the new jobs, will be, because they haven't been invented yet. One of the answers, uh, if I were a Prussian futurist, say, at the end of the 19th century, is, uh, you know, don't worry, 20% uh, of the workforce will be engaged in thinking about poetry and music and science and art uh, you know, we had 52,000 college students in 1870. We have 15 million today. Another 15 million people that service them as faculty and staff, that's 30 million people. That's 20% of the workforce doing something we regard as useful that completely didn't exist at all uh, about a century earlier. So we're, we're actually moving up Maslow's hierarchy. Uh, you know, people were just involved with basic elements of survival a century ago. Uh, now an increasingly large fraction of the population can actually get some satisfaction and uh, per identification and uh, uh, self-actualization from their, from their work. That, that was very rare a century ago. Yeah, I, you know, part of the problem is just the way human beings are. Uh, are, um, we tend to, because our, we are geared towards survival, we tend to be very alert to potential threats, uh, to not just existential threats, but even threats to our well-being. So, for example, it's very easy for the media to report how many jobs have been lost. This is a threat to our well-being. But we don't do a very good job of describing all the jobs that we have gained, or the new jobs that exist out there. Uh, and it's a very well-known theory in behavioral economics that the fear of a loss, the aversion to a loss, is greater than the expectation of a gain. This is one of the underpinnings of behavioral economics. And as you know, Ray, since the 2008 financial crisis, we've all become behavioral economists, essentially. The, there's an old phrase in the news business, uh, we don't report that the planes have landed on time. Uh, and I think uh, that's true, and uh, that's also a little bit of the problem. The new jobs is a very interesting issue. We did a story uh, a couple years ago on uh, 25 new jobs in the last five years, and, and one of them, there was a story of somebody interviewed an internet scrubber. This, this, this man was employed by a company to do nothing but be on the internet and take false things off about clients. Essentially, uh, there's a company, Reputation Defender, it's out there, but something like that. This is a job that didn't even exist two years prior to that. Uh, I'm not suggesting this is a huge growth area, but it's an example of uh, job growth that I don't think we describe very well out there. So, in a sense, I'm challenging my own business, the media, to be a little bit better at describing what you're talking about, and not just life expectancy, but all the, the other good things that are happening. Uh, Ray, uh, you mentioned you're working on a new book. Any timeline for this? Can you uh, give us a little uh, uh, hint of when it might be out? 2017 is probably optimistic, so I'd look for 2018. Okay. Ray Kurzweil, it's always the highlight of this conference when you appear in front of us, and we appreciate all of your thinking and uh, the fact that you've been on the vanguard of this for so many, many years, and we hope, of course, that you'll remain where you belong, which is on the vanguard of it. Ray Kurzweil, thank you very much for being with us.